Hello. How you doing? My name is Paul Kaiser, and I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. And I had a lot of fun as a little kid. I started out, um, I guess you could say, uh, from the age of uh, eight years old, everything I wanted to do was music. Um, I started out listening to songs like by Roy Hamilton. And I had a best friend, his name was Joe Covington. And we sung in the same group together. But I mean to say, I took him to that little record play we had and I said, Joe, listen to this, listen to the music. And he didn't understand what I was talking about. I said, just check it out, listen to it. And he said, um, I, I um, don't know what you're talking about, PK. And I said, it's different. And what was different about it was the song had horns and strings. And no, 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 no other songs that they had out during that time really had the horns and strings the way uh, we listened to what you called soulful music. So as, as, as time went on, I sung with this group called the Valators. The Valators consisted of uh, my best friend. We played Little League Baseball together, and who would know it, but they could also sing. And that was Joe Covington. That was Ron Thomas, and that was a guy named MacArthur Mumford. He was on bass, but then I changed with John Folks. John Folks was on bass with us. And um, it was George Tynes, and then I changed from George Tynes to Billy Scruggs. Um, anyway, we called ourselves the Valators, and we went singing around and trying to get, you know, a deal, a record deal, as they say. My worst whooping and my last whooping I got was when I play hooky from school and I went to New York, 1650 Broadway. That's where all the record companies were at. All the record companies um, were, um, how can I put it, were in this building called 1650 Broadway. And 1650 Broadway was um, a place, you can name it from the Shirelles, Guys Who Brothers, um, uh, let me see, um, from not Jerry Butler, but um, what was his name? Wilson Pickett, um, uh, Chuck Jackson, all those people. You know, they had record company. They had they they were entertainers, and they all came out of 1650 Broadway. Um, we it had about 14 floors to it, with about 20 um, offices in each floor. And I went from the top to the bottom, trying to get a record deal, and I couldn't get no deal. <laughs> but during that time. I also worked as a little saxon in a church called Clear Memorial Methodist Church. That's where I actually learned how to play the piano. Because every time, and the organ. As I would go up in the choir loft, uh, when I would be dusting off the, you know, the benches and things like that in the choir loft, I would be attracted to that organ. And I'd be playing that organ. And one day, Reverend Brown, I never forget, he came and he saw me. And I got nervous. He said, no, he said, PK, go ahead on. Continue to play, continue to play. And so I played. I would eat, sleep, and drink music. That was my love. Uh, that was the love. I was always good in English. So as time went on, um, um, our group, we cut a little demo tape. And a little demo tape, uh, it didn't go nowhere. You know, like I said, we shopped it. And I said that my last weapon was because we played hooky from school. And out of all the luck, the the um, um, people from the... Uh, True Officer's office would call my house to see what I was I was doing. And my mother said he's in school. They said, no, he's not. He stayed home today. But I was over in New York trying to shop a record deal. As time went on, I um, uh, went in, uh, uh, went into high school, got married, um, uh, never forget my prom night and all the wonderful things, but still in the back of my head was that music thing. As, uh, as, as a little bit of time went on, I um, uh, got an opportunity to go to Detroit, to go to Motown. This, this was during my first year of, of being married, and um, I had an opportunity to work over in Detroit at Motown. But, um, you know, it didn't happen. So I came back and uh, continued to um, work. I, I, Broke the color line at PSCNG, Public Service and Gas Company. Broke the color line. Um, as I moved on, um, I, I think that 
during that time, um, that was a very, very difficult time in my life, you know, because um, being young, wanting to be successful in the music business, um, you know, hanging out with the, trying to hang out with the boys and doing all the things that you wanted to do, sometimes your life changed and um, things go dark. When I say things go dark, there's a period of life where it wasn't good. Okay, and, and I was talking about uh, things that changed in, in, in my life at the age of, let's say, 20 years old. Young, foolish, stupid, and I just, um, uh, when you have your brain, you know, set on, you know, one thing, you know, um, music, 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 but then you're still hanging out with the boys, when, you know, when you're doing your little thing, and uh, you go, to, you go to what I call dark ages. When I say dark ages, I mean um, back in the '60s, Jersey City was a town that was um, a beautiful town. Everybody, and I mean, everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew what was going on. Uh, things changed. Uh, drugs and everything else came into the the town. I never was a person that I never did drugs or smoke pot things like that. But I sure could drink like a like a fish and whatnot. And um, it it took me through a two-year span, and those what I call my dark ages stopped, and then moved on was a step with the college. I was going to college, and uh, almost lost. When I say I almost lost my family, but you never lose your family. You um, uh, you you grow up and you mature and you become a person of uh, 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 of a better character, uh, you know, type the better character type thing, as. As as life went on, um, my my son, my first son, he was a little baby, a little a little small type, and I had a responsibility as being a father, and I had a daughter responsibility. Um, while do, do, but while spending my time in college, I I majored in music. Music was my thing. I went to I said I'm a major in music. In the beginning, I started out uh, studying accounting, but uh, you know that was something that was an associate's uh, degree. Um, as time went on, um, I, I met a friend, um, his name was Tommy, I'll never forget him, Tom Betry. We went to Rutgers University together. And um, we, um, I was trying different things. I had this group, um, the first group that I have ever recorded. Um, and this is going back. I'm going to go back, you know, because you think of things and you say to yourself, oh, wait a minute now. There was a group I had, they would call themselves the superlatives. Um, and um, uh, it was one of my first crack at uh, trying to be some sort of a record producer. And um, I um, went down to Philadelphia, and I hooked up with some uh, with, with some friends. Uh, my cousin, um, I had a cousin that could play drums. Uh, that was uh, his name was Norman, and um, some of the other people that I had I, I were professionals. Uh, a, a, a guy that I hooked up with down uh, down in Philly. His name was Tommy Bell, and you know Tommy Bell from, I guess, the Delphonics and the Stylistics. He produced all that stuff with them back in the back in the day. So what I did, I did this song called um, um, "Burning Sensation," and um, uh, the other side was um, "I Have Searched." I thought "I Have Searched" was going to be the A side, but I'm going to tell you the story about that in a minute. Um, after recording that, um, uh, the people who took me in the studio uh, to do some other things was uh, Hal and Marion Weiss. And uh, we recorded the group, The Superlatives, on a song called I Still Love You. And it was flipped with um, um, We're So Lonely. Now, Marion said to me, she said, yeah, we're going to record the song, but I'm going to take 50% of your song. I said, I don't care, take it. I just wanted to be get my foot in the door. You know, I was happy with that. So we recorded um, um, those songs. The record came out. It did, you know, did pretty well. We, The guys performed at Palisades Park, and we did some shows with Marvin Gaye, and, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Um, now, the song um, um, I Have Search has a funny... A twist to it. When I did, I have certain, my best friend had just came home from the service, Joe Covington, and so we would meet at night on Montgomery Street at this bar, uh, and um, we, would, we would make a plan of 
going to travel south to promote this record I have searched. Well, we did. 1967, I went on the road with that record I have searched. And got a, got a little airplay, things like that. But I wound up, you know, going back to school. Forgot all about the, the song. But when I did it, the pressing plan that I used, I it, it only, all I could do, because I couldn't afford to, I only could afford to do a one-step process. A one-step process is a strike-off. It's good for pressing maybe 3,000 45s, maybe 4,045s. And so that, um, um, that was good, uh, you know, per se, for what I want to do, but I only pressed up 300 records. That was it, 300. But what the pressing plant did, they bootlegged the record overseas. And it became a uh, it became a hit. The however, little did they know the stamp was broke. <laughs> when the stamp was broke, uh, they tried to copy you know to make more uh, um, uh, records from the stamper, but the record was a little bit too noisy, so they couldn't get a legit copy. So they the the label was called Kaiser Records. So they called uh, into um, Jersey City, that I had Jersey City on the record, and they called this record shop Stan Krauss. Uh, Stan Krauss is the record shop, and they said, how do we get a hold of this guy, Paul Kaiser? We, you know, he's got a hit record overseas. And Stan said, I think Paul's in school, way in school or something. And so, um, uh, anyway, Stan was able to call my house, and, um, you know, um, I was contacted, and I called the people overseas, and they said, you know, we, you know, we want to do a deal with with you with that with that record, the uh, Burning Sensation. I said, Burning Sensation. That's the B side. They said, No, it's a hit over here in Europe. And I'm wondering how in the heck did the record become a hit? And so then <laughs> I went home, and I said, Well, I got to get this, um, uh, you know, get them this record. They said, What do you want? And I just said, I'm a, I'll fix them. So somebody was bootlegging my record. I want seven thousand dollars, and they said, Good, we'll give it to you. We'll 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 ship it overseas from overseas over you get it within 24 hours i said this are they serious <laughs> i went home and i looked for the tapes the tapes that fell down on the floor in the closet my mother's closet and the mice had already started nibbling on the tape i said oh lord i hope i can get it so i had a good uh, a good copy of it but what i did i didn't send them a copy i sent them a copy of a copy like like mix like the second mix, it sound almost as good as what I had, and I never wanted to give them the original. So they were happy with that, and it was a big hit overseas. I didn't know, but those 300 copies down the road will, will have made history. And when I say made history, I'll, I'll tell you about that later. After, um, after that, um, I did a song, a uh, recorded group called The Superbs, and they had a song um, called Love's Unpredictable. And um, that, you know, I guess that did um, okay. You know, it did, did, uh, you know, it was a little bit of something. And um, I would, um, weekends, I would get my, the love of my life, uh, my, um, uh, my son Derek and my daughter Wanda, and we'd hang out together and whatnot. <laughs> there, was a little, there was a little tight. But it's a funny thing. I was tickled because I had a little swing. It was my, called my Bambi, and my mother kept that for me. And when I was a little baby, about Derek's size, I would get in and I would rock in it. And that same little Bambi thing, I put Derek in when he was little, and Derek got it. He was rocking back and forth. And I said, you know, I that was mine when I was his age, when I was a, uh, when I was a little kid. And so um, some of the good points in my life was looking forward to being with my kids, you know, hang, you know, hanging out with them. They were little. And also, you know, going back to school, finishing up my music. So the next um, uh, act that I, I, I got with um, uh, was a group out of, um, also a group out of Philadelphia. And um, that group was called Brendan the Tabulations. You know, and I worked with Brendan the Tabulations for uh, um, about a minute and, um, um, I was asked to do something else in Philly, and it was this was funny. <laughs> um, 
the guy, his name was Billy Ross. And Billy, uh, I called him, I said, look, I know you're doing shows at the Uptown Theater. I said, my name is Paul Kaiser, so I, you know, I'm an arranger now, and I, and I could uh, do charts for you and whatnot. He said, Paul Reiser? He said, yeah, man, I heard of you. Come on down and get with the group. So I got down there, and I worked with Brendan Tabs, and I worked with um, uh, this other group, and I did, was doing the arrangement for the whole stage show, which consists of the Delphonics, <laughs> which consists of the, um, what do you call those, the intruders and the vibrations, you know? And so, um, and he, you know, he, and he would keep calling me Paul Reiser, Paul Reiser. And I, I, I would say, no, Paul Kaiser, you know, I'm Paul Kaiser. He was Paul Reiser, he would say that. So the night of the show, you know, the band, the orchestra was there. And so he would, um, you know, he was introducing me to Peter. He said, fellas here, I want you to meet, I got a great arranger here. Uh, I want you to meet Paul Reiser from Detroit, because that was the arranger who was doing all that Motown stuff. His name was Paul Reiser. And so I said, no, I'm not Paul Reiser from Detroit. And he said, well, who are you then? I said, I'm Paul Kaiser from Jersey City. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so he looked. And so, but just fortunately, Tommy Bell was there. And Tommy Bell knew me. And so he said, man, this ain't the, you know, he, he's got all these arrangements I had him to do and whatnot. And Tommy Bell knew me. He said, hey, he said, Kaiser, is everything okay? I said, yes, fine. And Tommy Bell walked over and said, man, don't worry about a thing. I know him. And so it was time for me to, with, the orchestra was there. And I count down the music and whatnot, and everybody just came in just right, and everything was, was okay. Everything worked out fine. So when he went to pay me, he said, man, I thought you were Paul Riser from Detroit. If I knew you were Paul Kaiser from Jersey City, I wouldn't be paying you all this money I paid you, <laughs> he said. So anyway, everything was fine. And um, that, that hunger for me to be able to be uh, you know, uh, uh, an arranger was, you know, continuing on. So then um, I had another, during that time when I was in college, I had another daughter that was born, um, child number three. And then I, um, uh, um, there was this group called, um, let me see, I, you know, I don't even remember their name now, but I named them the New Sound Express. Here's what happened. Um, there was a group in East Orange that I, mean, I knew, and there was a girls' group from East Orange also. They called themselves the uh, Superbs. And when I re when I recorded them, um, this this young lady, her name was Phyllis Phyllis Harris, one of the best female vocals I ever worked with. I mean, she was a in pocket singer, fantastic. And um, I recorded her on a song called um, "The Dawning of Love," and. The flip side was so glad you're home. Once again, Dawning of Love was a beautiful song. It was, you know, about society. But that song, So Glad You're Home, was the hit. That was a hit. And I should have put that out. Anyway, I got a deal with this guy from New York. His name was Juggy Murray. Juggy Murray, he owned, you know, Baby Washington, you know, the time. And he had also, um, Har you know, something Harrison. I forgot whatever his name was, and Charlie and I, Inez Fox, that Juggie Mary. Uh, and so um, we, um, you know, we made a deal. He never even promoted the record. So I got another deal with a guy named Jerry Ross from um, New York, and he put the record out um, on the girls, The Dawning of Love, and it made the national billboard charts. My first record to make the charts. And I remember running home to my mother and said, Ma, look. And I remember her calling me and said, Pete, get the songs on the radio. <laughs> and I was happy. We went to Cleveland, Ohio, and everything was wonderful. Everything was peachy cream. And, you know, the girls were about to go to um, uh, the Apollo Theater. And tragedy, I'm going to call it tragedy struck, but, yeah, it's, uh, uh, Phyllis was only 15 years old at the time, we all were young people at the time, and the girl with her boyfriend, she had a miscarriage, and she was in the hospital. And so our Apollo appearance didn't happen. And I was like crushed, I said, oh man, I don't believe this, man, all the work that I did, and you know, they, they, we're not gonna be at the Apollo Theater. So after that, um, 
uh, I got some some replacement girls to to uh, perform with them. Uh, Henrietta Young and um, and Henry and her and her cousin and her girlfriend. They were from out of Patterson, New Jersey. Henrietta wound up. We we did a show in in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, I knew um, Ray Goodman and Brown. They were then called the Moments, and I knew Al Goodman, you know, pretty well. We ran met met each other, and so we were doing a prom. My my group, the girls' group. And the moments they were at the prom too. So uh, I introduced Al to Henrietta because Al kept eyeing her and whatnot. I said, oh, I think something's going on there. And Al met her. Well, when I introduced the two of them, I didn't think that they would start going together. Not only did they start going together, but they got married. And Al Goodman of the moments who who became uh, you know uh, Ray Goodman and Brown. Whenever I'd be around, I, I would say, yeah, there's my buddy Paul Kaiser out there in the audience. He introduced me to my wife. He said, I don't know whether to hug him or choke him. <laughs> that was something that was, uh, I, I, I remember that so well. So anyway, um, I, there was this group. They were, mis I could call them misfit guys from Jersey City. And um, Roscoe Taylor, who worked for Bikita's Insurance Agency down by the junction, and um, uh, his boys, his his little band. Uh, also, me and my buddy Tommy, we had an office up in General Square, a little place, and that's where um, Cool and the Gang, Cletus and George and them, uh, I let them go up there to rehearse. That's, that's where they rehearsed their first album at, right there at uh, my little place. We were all young, very young. Then I was, you know, I was in school still. So after that, um, I had. Um, um, this group, this I mean, for me, Starnes, they were called the New Sounds. These boys were bad. And we went in the studio and recorded the song, Ain't It Good Enough. And people don't know this, but um, after I finished producing them, and um, then I got a phone call from a lady. She had a beauty parlor in, in these Starnes. And she said to me, I like what you did with my group. <laughs> and, I, and I said, your group? I said, it's supposed to be my group. And so I went to see her. And she said, you know, my brother sings lead with that group, and but the song's instrumental ain't good enough. And I said, well, wait a minute now. They never told me about, you know, you. And so I asked, I said, guys, why didn't you tell me about uh, 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 her? And they said, well, you know about her now. You see, sometimes when... People go in the studio and record, it goes through their head, you know, and they, you know, they think they're Mr. Big Shot. So um, I just said, you know, that's it. That's, you know, um, we're not going to do nothing together. Um, and so I said, I got this ragtag, I call it ragtag, a bunch of guys, uh, Roscoe Taylor and his boys, El Ellsworth Anderson, all these guys from Jersey City. And I said, guys, I'm gonna put you guys together. I'm gonna I'm, I have, I'm gonna have you guys do this record. But prior to that, a guy from um, uh, was it Universal Booking Agency, no Queens Booking Agency, called me and said, uh, "Guys, I need a band to go up to Buffalo to um, uh, 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 work with this uh, artist. Uh, what was his name? I, it'll come to me in a few minutes. Anyway, he was he was out of out of Memphis, Tennessee." And so um, he had a hit record that was happening then. And so I said, can you guys read, man? And Ross said, oh, yeah, we can read. So we drove up there, and it was like a snowstorm and everything. And we got up there, and the, uh, the band, uh, the, the manager, he pulled out the charts. I went to the piano. I said, I'm going to play the piano. So I gave the music to the guys, and the guys looked at it. And I said, well, you guys can read. Yeah, but, and, and I said, well, we're going to have to read. He said, you mean all at once? You know? <laughs> And I said, oh, my God. I said, y'all can't read. And so the guy said, these guys can't read. So I said, I'm going to try. So I tried to play the piano loud and tried to get them to. And them guys, I mean, it was terrible. It was terrible. And so um, <laughs> that night the, the show, the manager said, man, you got to do the show because we got to get our money to go back down to Memphis. We ain't got no money. And so I said, guys, we need to get money to get back home. So... What happened, they decided, you know, I, I mean, we tried. 
and we was uh, uh, was it Wham Bell. I think that was the name, Wham Bell. That's who it was. And so he went out on that stage crying. I mean, we sound bad. And so you know, the next day or the day after, when we got back uh, to Jersey City. Uh, Jimmy Crawford, that was his name, the booking book He called me, he said, Paul Kaiser, don't you ever call me again. I don't speak to you no more. I said, well, I didn't know the guys couldn't read. <laughs> and so he said, you know, uh, Wim Bell, he went back to Memphis. He was crying like a baby. I said, I'm sorry, but he got paid at least. So anyway, Roscoe and them, I said, I'm going to make a band out of these guys. And I rehearsed them, practiced with them, rehearsed them. And they covered the song, Ain't, Ain't It Good Enough. A lot of people don't know that. And I brought another guy in the group. His name was Jimmy Chandler. Jimmy Chandler was known around the area and whatnot. And, uh, and he was a pretty good singer. So I made, I made the band you know, pretty tight. And they toured all over the place, you know, uh, doing shows and whatnot. The flip side of the song was called um, uh, I've Been Trying. And old, it was... Um, uh, impression song, you know. I've been trying, Lord knows I've been trying. And so we never paid attention, they never paid attention to that side of the song. I said, learn it, but you know, the, the hitters ain't a good enough, the instrumental. So once again, they went to Buffalo, New York, the Hound Dog. Uh, you know, the Hound Dog was known for taking records and flipping it over, you know, and playing the, and making the other side a hit. They got, my brother Teddy went up to Boston with them. May my brother Teddy rest in peace. Not B Buffalo with them. And so, <laughs> they got up there and they did a series of songs and then they played Ain't It Good Enough. And so, so then people said, play the hit. Play I've Been Trying. And so I said, uh, and, 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 and so they said, I've been trying. And they looked at each other and said, that's the hit up here. <laughs> and so they tried to make their way through that song. And it was very hard because they thought the hit was where everything else was. It ain't good enough. So um, uh, what happened, um, you know, they came back. They got better. They did Boston. They did, you know, they traveled all over the place, and they, they, got, they got a whole lot better. They were easy to work with. The, um, uh, while we did a show in, in, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, I never will forget this, but 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 first, um, here's the sequence of how things happened. Um, I was doing, I was uh, in college still, and I came home, and I I used to sing with a, a group called the Barbershop Quartet with a guy named Pee Wee, Pee Wee Burgess out of Jersey City. He sung with Cliffy Perkins, and I knew Cl Cliffy, but I didn't know Cliffy as well. As me and Pew, me and Pew were tight. Earl Davenport was like a cousin of mine, like a distant cousin of mine. And um, Herman Hammond, you know, I knew Herman from when he sung with another group. So they were saying they were in the blues. They said we can't get a deal, we can't get nothing, we can't get nothing going at all. And so I said, well, you know, guys, I said, you know, I will produce you guys, I will record you. And they said, really? I said, yeah. So. I decided to, to, I was doing stuff with a guy named Irvin Levine and Larry Brown. They did, they wrote the song, Tie Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. And the friend of theirs named Posner, Harvey Posner, he was a battery salesman. So I got with um, um, uh, Irvin and, and Larry because they had a song called Mandingo Woman. And uh, this was what was they, we thought was gonna be the A side. And I said, okay, I got the song called um, uh, Body and Soul. But the song, and I want to make this clear, I didn't write Body and Soul for the Soul Generations. I wrote Body and Soul for the New Sound Express. They had a guy named Vince, Vince Jackson. He played guitar. He could sing like the Delphine. He was the one that I wrote Body, Body and Soul for. I had a contract with them. I didn't have a contract with Pee Wee and them. When we went to Pee Wee, we were like grew up together. We were tight. We were good friends. So um, I went in the studio and I recorded Body and Soul. And uh, I did Mandingo Woman first. But back then, you know, the horns, the strings, and everybody came in at the same time and recorded everything, you know, together. And then you, and so 
when I when I kicked off Body and Soul, here's Larry Brown, Earl Levine, you know, Grammy winners and everything. They came out and they shook my hand. They said, Paul, you got the hit. I said, what do you mean? They said that Body and Soul is a smash. And I said, uh, okay, we'll see. And so um, as, that, as that happened, um, I would shop in the record. So during that time, I had the New Sound Express. And so they, um, they were doing a show down in Baltimore, Maryland. And I was in, there, it was amateur night. And I said, why do I got to put myself through all this here, listen to these, other, these little amateurs before my act can go on? So then I heard this voice. I heard this voice saying, you and I must make a path. And I listened, I said, who in the heck is that? I mean, the, the speaker was so tall that I couldn't see who he was. And I went around the speaker, and I saw these little five guys. And I saw this little kid, you know, singing that song. I said, who is he? So I said, and so when they came off the, the stage, I said, take me to your manager. Who's your manager? And so the assistant manager was there. And his name was Kenneth Smalls. And I said, what's your name? I said to the kid, little, little boy, he must be 11 years old, something like that. He said, my name is Jimmy Briscoe. I said, Jimmy Briscoe. And so I said, take me to your leader. And so the manager came down there. I said, I love this kid. I love this kid. But what I didn't want to do, there was already a Jackson 5 out. I did not want the Little Beavers, because they, they, they were called the Little Beavers. All I wanted was Jimmy Briscoe. And Jimmy would not <laughs> come with me without his boys, the, you know, the Little Beavers. So I said, okay, I'm going to call you guys Jimmy Briscoe and the Little Beavers. And so that was, that was how Jimmy Briscoe and the Little Beavers started. During that time, I was still shopping the um, Soul Generations record for about almost a half a year. Every record company turned me down. I couldn't even give the record away. Couldn't give it away. And so... I was embarrassed. I said, man, how am I going to tell Cliffy and Pee Wee and them guys, my friend, I can't get a deal from them. And so I was embarrassed. And so I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it out myself. Now, I had uh, I had partnered with a guy named Harvey Posner, the battery uh, salesman, and we both went in, you know, um, together on this project here. I wrote the song, arranged the song, produced the song, Got all the musicians, did everything. Taught Clifty the song, had to hold his hand, you know, to, to do it. So, um, uh, I pressed up, the pressed up records did, it was only nine cents a copy. So, I pressed up 2,000 copies. And I sent it down to Baltimore, Washington, you know. And um, so, and I put my, my dorm telephone number, the, the pay phone, <laughs> on the record, uh, the first record. So, um, all of a sudden, the guy knocked on my room door and said, Paul, this guy, some guy is calling you from Baltimore. His name is Jay Dudley. Never will forget that name. And so I went to the phone. He said, you Paul Kaiser? And I said, yeah, that's me. He said, you got that record body and soul, huh? And I said, yeah. And he said, you better press up a whole lot of records. I said, why, what's going on? He said, man, you got a smash. He said, the phones is ringing off the hook. Everybody, they're loving this record. And so my buddy Tommy, you know, um, uh, uh, he was a white boy. He was majoring in, uh, in business, but we knew each other for music and whatnot, so we were about the same age. So, you know, he was a heck of a marketing person. So I said, okay, we got a record now. Let's roll with it. And so I rolled with that, you know, went with that record. Now I had one, two, three records on the charts. I had minor hit records back then because the record for Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers uh, came out before the Soul Generations record came out because I was still trying to get a deal. I was able to get a deal with Atlantic Records on Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers. They had a song called Sugar Brown. And so I went to the Apollo Theater uh, to see Bobby Schiffman, and I played the record for Bobby Schiffman. And Bobby Schiffman said, you know what I'm going to do, Paul? I'm going to put them on my Christmas show with um, Stevie Wonder. And, and I said, wow! You know, Stevie Wonder. So um, I... Um, uh, we went and we, uh, uh, and so Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers came up and they did the show. And 
overnight, these guys were a sensation. People were talking about them, and, and everybody was loving them. So um, then, you know, I had to, you know, work the, the soul generation. I had a friend um, called Moore. He had a tavern in Jersey City. His business was not doing as what he wanted it to do. And so I said, I'm going to help you out, Lee Moore. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring the New Sound Express in there and uh, I have this, because the, they got a record that was happening. I said, bring the soul generations in there. They're still waiting for me to get a deal. And so uh, they sold out the place the whole, that whole Christmas weekend. So um, after that, you know, Beavers uh, did the Apollo. They were backed by popular demand within another month. That's how popular they were. You know, people, were, it was unbelievable. So when the Soul Generations record went out, remember one thing that I forgot. So um, the record had taken off. Now, I put the record out. My associate who was with me, Posner, he said, oh, man, I don't deal with no record. I don't deal with that. So, but when the record broke, he wanted to deal with it. Tommy, my friend Tommy, he had no no part in the in the record at all, uh, you know, unfortunately, because he never believed in the soul generations, but um, I believed in them. Now, here goes the tricky part that everyone wants to know, like, how, what happened to uh, the soul generation. Me and Pee Wee, we were in the back room working on a song called, you know, and he started the song out, so let, let me give him the credit for that. Um, but there was a song called Million Dollars. People would always be told, I got the song, I got the song, I got the song, I got the song. And so what happened was this. Nobody was getting along. And um, um, so Posner knew that I had the controlling interest of the record. That was, I wrote the song, I produced the song. So what he did, he couldn't sell it to a his interest to a major record company without me, because I refused to, um, you know, uh, sell. So he sold it to his interest to some people out of Newark. And they were, in the first time you hear the real deal story, they were gangsters. He sold us down the creek. The next thing I knew, some guys came walking to my office smoking cigars. Well, I was a street dude, so from Jersey City, so I wasn't afraid of nobody. I was, they came to walking in that way, and I stuffed the cigar down their throat, <laughs> and the, and they came back again, and so they communicated with the soul generations, and um, um, they had to try to keep everything clean. Then they came to my office and put a suitcase of money on my desk. They said, "We don't want the guys. We want you. You the brains of the thing. I mean, without you, what are we going to do?" So. I said, no way, it ain't happening that way. So then they, for their little per small percentage, they're gonna try to sue or try to try to get, uh, you know, uh, do it another way. So Cliffy, Cliffy had a cousin named Bill Perkins. Bill Perkins was, so I got Bill Perkins, I didn't know nothing about legal stuff, so I got Bill Perkins to be the lawyer. I don't know if you ever heard of Bill Perkins. So Bill Perkins, I gave him a check for $400 to handle, you know, this case for me. I was down in D.C. working on some other stuff with Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers, and Tommy was up there. So they talk, uh, Tommy said, Paul, that's, they want to do this deal. You know, they want to do this deal. I talked to my father, and I, I told him, I said, this is a big mess. And so he told me, he says, as long as you're on the outside looking in, you always have a chance to fight. But once you go on the inside, you're done. And I remember those words that he told me. And I said, nope, I have no way do I want to do any business. And so they came to me and said, Paul, we don't want no trouble, but I'm going to tell you something. I said, what are you going to tell me? They said, we got your lawyer. I said, you got my lawyer? I said, are you going to have my lawyer? They said, we got your lawyer. And the next thing I knew, the Soul Generations was with them. And I was, I refused to go. They said, you mean you're gonna, you're gonna give up your group? And I said, I'll give up my group. I'm not gonna do business with them. I said, people will be on my side behind this thing here because I'm in the right. Well, guess what? I was wrong because 
I was looked at as the bad guy. You know, you know, I, I was only one voice. They had four voices, and it was bad. It was just ugly. It was a very, very sad part of my life. I was very, very down. I was, I was hurt. I was really hurt. I lost the group, and I said, "Well, they only get one more record. That's a million dollars." I said, "That that stands a chance. Outside of that, they ain't got nothing else." So, I was the I was down, and so. The, I was told, they said, they said uh, this, this Jewish guy told me, they said, well, Paul, there should be hits where that's coming from. If you could do any, anything, the writing. So I went back in the studio and I recorded Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers on a song called Where Were You When I Needed You? And that became a pretty nice little hit for me, you know? And so I said, man, okay, we're doing good. So Generations was out, they were doing um, uh, well, with the the million, the song million dollars, and I said they'll never get another hit after that, you know. And so, it was a bitter spot because I being looked at as the, you know, the bad guy, you know, behind this. I said this don't make sense. During that time, my cousin Earl, he had, he quit the group, and um, uh, so I said I gotta find a way to bounce back. So I was in my office, and I was hearing this guy named um, Johnny Halunka told me, Paul, if you you know you had that hit, there's got to be more hits where that came from. And I, that was when I did, the, the, like I had mentioned before, the Where Were You When I Needed You? And that was a, a semi-pretty you know big hit. But then um, there was this disc jockey that I would listen to, and I thought, I, I said, I, I mentioned Hank Spam, but... It was Gary Bird. That was his name. I know it would come to me. He would always say, how's everybody doing, my Ebony Prince and Princesses? You know, how's everybody doing, my Ebony? He would always say that. And I said, that's a nice title for a song, uh, Ebony, My Ebony Princess. So I sat down, and I started writing the, um, you know, I was playing the melody, dee, dee, bee, dee, bee, dee, dee. And it was my, and so I did that. I kept playing my ebony princess. Yes, you are my, and and so then I then I structured the melody of the song. There was this there was this girl who sung background with the uh, the beavers on uh, the song called Where Were You When I Needed You, and her name was Lana Rush, uh, one of the most talented young people that I ever met in Jersey City. I had to, in the song, be able to get the point of view of a young black woman, you know. Now, me being a man, um, I, I put the, like, your eyes are dark, I, I could put that, and I could put, you know, um, uh, you know, My Ebony Princess, the hook, the melody, the thing, but I didn't know how to say certain things or certain the way the flow, and I got with uh, Lana uh, Rush. And Lana put the icing with me on the cake with that part there where she sung the, you know, she sung that, um, uh, well, my black princess, I'm beholding it to you. You, 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 you know, the bron long bronze fingers. I would have never said bronze fingers. I would have never said that. She did that. I, I got to give her credit from where that credit was due. But then the, the, the point to, to make the song work, Okay, you got the melody, you got the song. Now it's the time to do the arrangement of the song. Now to do the arrangement, I had to write the parts out for the bass line, the guitar parts, write those parts out, the horns, the French horns, the violins. I had to do all that stuff with the bells to make it. I had a certain style. And when I put all that stuff, the bells and the strings together, I knew right then, I said, this is going to be a smash. I said, this is going to be a hit. And with the arrangement and everything. And so when that came out, one of the DJs on the radio says, well, with that little feud of the soul generations and Paul, we know the man behind that sound. <laughs> and it's Paul Kaiser. So uh, there was a show. I call it My Redemption. And in the show, it was the Manhattans was on the show. The Soul Generations was on the show, and Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers was on the show. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, on that show, the Beavers had the number one record in New York, 
And so uh, <laughs> the girls were screaming. Blue Lover came to me and said, hey, uh, PK, we're going on first. We're going to get out of here. This is the Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers crowd. <laughs> so <laughs> Blue did his thing. So did the racers. They did their thing. And when Jimmy and Jimmy Briscoe came to me and said, Mr. Paul, he said, I know you, what you want us to do. You want us to just take over this crowd. I said, you know it, Jimmy. And Jimmy gave me a hug, and that little kid went out there with the beavers, and they tore the place down. And that's what I call the redemption of Paul Kaiser, because, you know, that sound of body and soul and all the other things and whatnot still resonated with my Ebony Princess. And so that, and then uh, I came back with five hits in a row with Jimmy Bishop and the Beavers. Uh, there was a song called Forever, I Only Feel This Way When I'm With You, I'll Care For You. And you know, we were, we were doing things, we, we were on the road. Um, one of the things that, but we were always in the shadow of the Jackson Five. Can't, you know, give them credit. Going back to the situation with the Soldier Race, I want to make something very, very clear. When I was to when, when Bill Perkins told me, he said, "Well, I gotta represent my cousin, but I heard there's some lawyer, you know, that's that's good with cases like this somewhere out in Patterson. I got his name here somewhere. Let me, let me just give you this name here." And and I said, "Okay." So I called this lawyer, and he's waiting for me. And he, um, you know, we, you know, we talked and whatnot. And so with the court, but you know, a, a record has a lo a, sh a short life shelf, you know. If you don't get it within the first six months or so, you know, that's it. The copyrights, I own. I own the song. I own everything. So <clears throat> there was nothing else. You know, excuse me. I'm sorry. We'll call it. There was nothing else that I could do. But the lawyer said, but this lawyer said, just give up everything. Just, 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 just give up. I said, I'm not giving up everything. I'm, I'm fighting everything like this here. And he kept saying to me, give up everything. Give up everything. So anyway, um... As time went on, as, as time went on, and I'm and I'm, I'm going to come back because there's a whole career of things. Um, four years ago, four years ago, I wanted to get something clarified with BMI, and I said, "Well, my lawyer back then was uh, was out of Patterson, so uh, I remember his name was Neil um, Neil Schiffman or Neil. Um, uh, I have it upstairs. Anyway." He was still there in the in in, in the, um, uh, Patterson, so I went to see him, and I said, "Do you remember?" He said, "I had thousands of cases since then," and I said, "Well, you know, um, it was recommended to, to to you by Bill Perkins. You know, remember that Bill, the name Bill Perkins?" And he says, "Bill Perkins, oh my old college roommate," and I said, "Well, I'd be damned." I said, "Well, I'd be dead gone." I said, they really tried to get me good. And so then I just said, okay, that's cool. So, I, you know, um, and I'll tell you the story. The reason why four years ago, five years ago, wherever it was and whatnot, is because Rick Ross, Jasmine Sullivan, and some other people uh, redid the song, My Ebony Princess. And um, it was the question of um, uh, MTV called, which they knew, they looked up the copyrights, and they saw the, the ownership was Paul Kaiser. But yet... Uh, they said, uh, you know, uh, somebody else did the deal. You know, it was, it was, it wrapped up the deal, so they had the rights to do it. And so my lawyer, uh, <laughs> Steve Kurtz, he was a pit bull. And he went after Universal, and then I got a call from, you know, Cliff. Said, oh, man, I thought we could work something out, dude, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to put him down. You know, I'm not going to, you know, because you got to let certain things go. So I, I let... I let that go, so you know. But um, it is what it is, you know. And so uh, the the reason why me and the Soul Generations did not continue our relationship was because I refused to get hooked up with a bunch of gangsters. They were North gangsters, mob guys, and whatnot. Who they were, and all they were was to, to soak the money. After a year, they were gone, and during that time. They called me up, Soldier Racer called me up and asked, could they meet with me? And I said, sure, come on down to my office. They came into my office, Cliffy, Pee Wee, Earl, and um, Herman. They all came up. They said, man, you're the one who made us. You're the one who did this. You're Mr. Body and Soul. I mean, come on, man, you know, let's get back together and let's make some music. 
there was still that bitterness that was that was in me and I regret what I did I went to the door and I said get the hell out that was wrong by me and I apologize to the guys I should have never did that I said get out I don't want to do I didn't want to do nothing with him because you have to let things go we were young black men in a white man's world of music and and so we little we, we all knew nothing about the business it wasn't the soul generation's fault they were innocent victims the same as I was but the way the system got was done we all got dragged into it so you know um, that's what happened I refused to produce them I refused to get involved and by me refusing to do that just imagine think about this had I went and continued to produce the soul generation I suppose we got a bunch of hits and whatnot and then those guys decided they wanted to get out and do that. They would have been stuck in there. They wouldn't have been able to get out of there. Them guys wouldn't have never let them go nowhere. And so um, um, it worked out better for them, and it worked out better for me because I came back with more hits, more songs, and more things. So moving on from the Soul Generations uh, era and moving on from, you know, me and Jimmy Biscoe and the Beavers continued to have our success. I had more success by producing... Um, a group called um, Storm, put them on the national billboard charts. Um, I did a single with Jimmy Chandler, and uh, who was with the New Sound Express, who changed their name to the Undefeated Movement. And only, or the only thing is this, the song Body and Soul was written for a guy by the name of Vince Jackson, who was the first tenor of the group, the New Sound Express. That's who I wrote that song for. Because I had a contract with them, I didn't have a contract with the Soul Generations. That was the difference. So um, um, as I went on, um, like the you know the fun of uh, you know going through the fun as to watch Derek was growing up, Juan was growing up. I had um, you know uh, a couple more kids and whatnot. Kids, I had a lot of kids. I raised more kids, so that's part of. Um, you know, but I loved every minute. I loved every minute of it, and 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 um, I remember um, when when the guy when Derek and the kids got a little older, and I sat down at the piano and um, I said, "Fellas, I'm gonna have this group." I said, "You guys are gonna harmony harmonize," and uh, I started trying to say, "Let's go, little guys," and they said to me, "Dad, we don't want to sing." I said, "What do you mean you don't want to sing? We have a group here." I said, "Well, what do you want to do?" We want to rap. <laughs> so I just said, oh, man. And I got up from the piano, and I just said, this is crazy. So during that time, um, by me being in a, in a professional arranger, um, I got a call to do, uh, you know, to do a couple of jingles. And um, because I th one of the people was not was sick or something, and this jingle house I went into to New York. So I went in, and I did... Uh, uh, a couple of jingles for them, and they loved it. And so I said, "Man, and, and you, uh, doing jingles, you make more money than being a record producer. I mean, doing doing jingles as an arranger. I mean, and you got your money right then and there. You didn't have to wait until a royalty check came in. You got your money right. So that was beautiful. That was wonderful. Um, uh, during that time, also, I toured with the Three Degrees. I was, you know." The arranger, you know, for, for the three degrees. So I did some, um, you know, wonderful things working with them. Um, uh, after that, um, as as time continued to go on, there was a group called Calendar, out of Jersey City, and um, it was a guy named Mousy and Pee Wee Bobby and, and those guys on the stand, um, Hager, and so I decided to, um, uh, you know. Uh, Lee Moore, that owned the bar, Moore said, he said, Paul, why don't you give these guys a break and, you know, you know, give them a shot. So I said, okay, why not? I'd, um, uh, <laughs> I, I took them, I rehearsed them and rehearsed them and rehearsed them. I said, man, this was, I mean, work with those, that was a job. I mean, that was rough. <laughs> and so I took them in the studio and um, uh, recorded a song called Hypertension. And... The record, you know, came out really, really, really nice. It did. We made the national billboard charts and everything, but the record took off like a bat out of hell in, in Europe overseas. Number one in Europe overseas and whatnot. I got the call 
you know, for them guys to go overseas, they were going to advance them $75,000, you know, and to come over, they'll be over there for four weeks. And I told the guys, I said, guys, we got to strike while the iron is on. And one of the guys said, well, I mean, if I go over there, can I fly back uh, uh, to see my wife? I mean, I can't leave her home. <laughs> like that. And I, they had me laughing. They had me cracking up. I said, fellas, we got to go now. Oh, man, I can't leave my job. I can't do this. And, and, and that's understandable. You know, some of the guys didn't want to leave their job. They had... That, and I said, well, why did you record? What did you record for, you know? I mean, this is the chance you take, you know? So they um, went, and um, they didn't go. And a couple of them did want to go, but, uh, you know, they, they didn't want to take that chance. Then, about a month and a half later, they came to me and said, we're ready to go now, we're ready to go now. And I said, it ain't going to happen now. See, a lifespan of a record, you know what I'm saying? You got to think of that lifespan you got to strike while the iron and the coals are hot. So they didn't go. I wound up doing an album on them. During that time also, I said, you know, you know, all these groups, I'm producing and doing things and whatnot. And so I said, I'm going to do something for myself. So I decided to do a whole album uh, called the Super Disco Band, you know, album. That mean, all instrumentals and whatnot. I had some background, you know, singers in and whatnot. Uh, one of the background singers that I used and whatnot was uh, my wife upstairs now. <laughs> she, she was uh, one of the background singers. So I did the um, uh, I did the Super Disco Band album, and it it it, it got national uh, uh, acclaim. It was it was this huge, big, and uh, when I looked at my royalty check, I said, "Whoa!" I said, "Wow, this is you know." This is fantastic, you know, and this is me doing, uh, you know, making a statement, doing my own thing. I said, I'm going to do my own thing. I met up with Roscoe and them again, Roscoe Taylor and them again, and I said, you know, maybe we might get together and we'll do an album. Got back with the soldiers, got back with Roscoe and them. They were called, they called themselves the Undefeated Movement. I said, you can't go out there with a name like that, so I changed it. And their name became Rise, R-H-Y-Z-E. And so here comes the the dirtiness in me. It happened, um, you know, after that with um, the, um, I decided to get back with the um, uh, um, Rise. And we, we, I changed the name to Rise. They were, they were the new, uh, they were the undefeated movement changed the name to Rise. So uh, the, the, the first thing uh, that I did, I had to this. Uh, figure out a style and uh, a way to work with them. And so I worked and, you know, I would go um, come to Jersey City up over the, um, where Bikita Sanders Insurance Agency, they had a little hall up there somewhere by the junction. And I go there and I would rehearse with them. And we practiced, we practiced and practiced until we went in the studio and I recorded, um, you know, I recorded all the songs. I, re I recorded all, during the, during the time that I recorded the songs, I bumped in. Who did I bump into? But Harvey Posner, the guy who sold his, who sold his rights to the, um, you know, the gang, the gang bangers. And so I said, you know, Harvey, I'm. He said, he said, oh, Paul, don't worry about. It. You know, you know, things happen now. You know, and uh, I see you're doing very, very well. I said, yeah, I got this group that I'm doing now, and um, I, you know, um, I'm trying to finish the album. He said, you got another album? He said, I want in. I want in. I want in. I said, you sure you want in? He said, I want in. I said, okay, sure. And so Harvey came in. He came in with me. The same person who screwed me before. So um, after I finished the album and everything, um, I said, you know, I'm having trouble getting a deal. This is, this, I'm having trouble getting a deal for, for this year. Oh, man, but I got my investment in here, you know? So I said, but I know somebody his name is Jimmy Dock, and I said, somebody who wants the, um, you know, to do the, to do the deal. He said, oh, man, that's great, that's great. So he said, he gave him a figure of just what he had kicked in. He said, that's all I could do. You know, I have Paul Kaiser, the producer anyway, so, you know, I'll work my deal out with him. He said, but I want a piece of publishing. I want a piece. He said, no, you can't have a piece of nothing. He said, you know, no. Uh, you know, either I walk away. He said, no, 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 okay, well, just let me get mine. And so he said to me, he said, he said, Paul, I got mine back. He said, Paul, well, you, well, good luck, good luck, good luck. And so 
Anyway, the song came out just as sweet as your love. And so Posner called me. He said, Paul, the record's out, man. BLS is playing it. It's, it's, it this is, it looks like it's going to be a hit. And I said, yeah. He said, oh, man, I was able to stay in there with that. And so, and then it really got played. It was, it got big. And then he, he you know, he called. He says, but, um, you know, hey, it's not Jimmy Jocker's label. It's on Sam Records. This place, uh, this other record company. And I said, really? I said, that's interesting. And so he was driving out in that area there. So he said, I know where that label's at. So he went to the record company. He said, you know, I could have had a piece of that record there and whatnot. And, but Jimmy Dockett must have sold it to you. And so Sam White said, who's Jimmy Dockett? He said, the guy who, uh, you know, had the, the label. He said, I don't know Jimmy Dockett. He said, all I know is Paul Kaiser. I did the deal with Paul Kaiser. <laughs> and then he said, oh, like that. And so then he called me up. He said, Paul, you got me real good, didn't you? And I asked when I let her, I said, let me tell you something. You dirty son of a bitch. I said, you almost destroyed my whole career. You ruined me. What you did, I wouldn't have done to nobody. I said, yeah, I set you up. And I said, I just want you to know one thing, that I could get to you whenever I wanted to. I could have gotten to you back then. I said... Now, I'm, re I'm at peace with what you did to me. And that was the story with him. I set him up and um, I moved on. I never needed his money. I never needed anything, but I felt that I owed that to him. So, <laughs> so Rise had a big hit record and um, they never knew anything about that. They never knew what was going on in the house. It was very, uh, you know, they, they, they traveled, they toured, they did a lot of things and whatnot. We had a good relationship, you know. I always had a good working relationship with Roscoe Taylor. And so, you know, it was fun. The, the whole ride was full of joy. And so, after that, um, I made a, I, I um, did another record with Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers. Um, and um, that record there didn't do too well. Um, the kids had grown up. And the little things that... I could hide when they were little cute little kids. You can't hide, you know, uh, anymore. So, and then um, Stanford, he had opened up, with the money he was making, he, he had opened up a, a club, a disco club in um, down there in um, uh, Baltimore. And eventually he had taken sick and he had passed away. But let me go back a little bit to the album. You know, the Beavers did, we did about, I did about three albums on Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers. And the Ebony Princess album that I did on Jimmy Bisco and the Beavers, I mean, it was a one, it was a love fest, you know, recording them. And while we were in the studio finishing up on the album, I got a call from Baltimore, and it was um, uh, 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 Robert Makins, the fellow who, who sung the first part on My Ebony Princess. It was his um, sister had called, and she told me that Robbie had to come home right away. His father had just been mur murdered in Cherry Hill in Baltimore, in Baltimore. And so I had to stop the session and tell Robbie, so Robbie, you gotta go home. We gotta take you to the bus, the, the train station, where you got, we gotta have to take you home. I told Kenny, one of my uh, guys who worked for me, to take him home. And he asked me, Mr. Paul, what? what's going on? What's the matter, uh, Mr. Paul? I said, Robbie, I don't wanna say. He said, you gotta tell me, you gotta tell me, what's the matter? And I told him, I said, your father, you know. He started crying. Everybody was crying in that studio, you know, that, that day. It was so sad and whatnot. And um, when Robbie left to finish up, uh, you know, some of the songs, Jimmy said, this is with Robbie. Robbie would want us to, you know, you know, do this. And so that was very difficult, very hard. Um, after that album, um, I mean, the Ebony Princess album, it went, it went go. I mean, it was such a huge hit. You know, it was such a big, uh, a big record for them. Then um, they did a, an album called Invitation to the World, and I had to make a very, very tough decision. The song Invitation to the World, the OJ's wanted that song, 
and um, uh, I said, no, I wrote for Jimmy. And I thought about how <laughs> I gave a song that I wrote for somebody else, and I gave it away. But something like that I should have gave given to the old Jays, though. You know, I should have, but I didn't. And Jimmy did the song. Uh, Imitation of the World made the charts did very, very well. And to the Milky Way did very, very well, made the charts. See, Jimmy and um, they were cute little boys, and the girls were crazy about them. So I could press up anything and sell over 100,000 pieces with him. And he had the certain style that the Japanese liked. So anything I did, I did licensing deals with the Japanese and, you know, England and all the other places and whatnot. I, 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 I did uh, very, very well. Did good with that. So after the um, second, you know, so after the, the third album with Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers, um, they were grown up. They were grown up then. And there was nothing more that I, I could, uh, you know, I could do. Jimmy's voice had changed, you know, and, he, you know, he no longer had that real light, pretty floating tenor anymore. His voice had gotten lower, but he still had a beautiful voice. You know, he, he could, uh, Jimmy could still sing. Uh, Jimmy got married, and uh, a couple of the other guys in the group got married, so um, life went on. Um, I, um, uh, during that time, I was, um, let me see now, uh, I had one or two and, you know, take some of my, my money and invest it in something, you know, and uh, i never forget that uh, that Christmas, also around that time, Derek was a young little, little um, guy, he must be about 12 years old, something like that, Derek was about, Derek was about my son was about that age, and so what I, and he wanted a, a, a bike, and I said I wanted to get him this special motorcycle type bike, you know, a uh, motorbike. And I said I know he really would, would like that. And I bought it for him. And when I bought it for him, uh, the look in his eyes when he saw it was worth a million dollars to me. I mean, the way he looked, the, the gleam that he had in his eye, the excitement, I said, uh, I'm proud, you know, that that I did that, you know, and uh, he was so happy. He was, you know, he was full of joy. That made me proud. That made me so proud. And so, um, you know, my, my kids, you know, I must say, good kids, good stock. So, as time, you know, as 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 time went on, the the, the rise second album was on um, um, what was it, the uh, 20th Century 20th Century Fox, and um, also, I got the offer to produce Stephanie Mills. And that was like, I said, oh, good, Scott. So 20th Century Fox um, sent the limousine down to pick up me and my wife to go. Stephanie was appearing in, in, in New York. We would, and they took, took me and my wife out to dinner and then went backstage. And, and she had just came off a heck of an album to do a stuff with in Tume. But what they wanted to do now they wanted to make her, you know, I was like a more of a pop. I get, you know, by being by me being an arranger and conductor, they wanted her to have that R and B thing with that pop, you know, that real sweet pop type type sound. And so they thought that I was the guy that could do that. And and Stephanie said, Yeah, I listened to some of your stuff and when I said, I really like it. It's gonna be a pleasure working with you. I said, It's gonna be a pleasure working with you too. Then 20th Century Fox was owned by RCA, and RCA, now Stephanie had one of that, that movie part in The Wiz, I'm talking about the, the Diana Ross did The Wiz, and Stephanie was really hurt when she did the Broadway Wiz, and so um, they didn't pick her to do the movie, they picked Diana Ross, and so, and that movie by the way it bombed, but uh, still in all, Stephanie was bitter. And so RCA had paid Diana Ross $33 million to sign with, with them. When Stephanie Mills heard that, and that's part of 20th Century Fox, she walked away. She left, <laughs> she left it. And there goes like, you see my dollars and cents floating away because um, when she left, that was it. That was 20th Century Fox bread and butter, you know, so as far as the record company was concerned. Um, 
Bryce came out with their their song on 20th Century as Fox called Just How Sweet Is Your Love. And um, it took off. It was like, psh, took off like, you know, uh, Dick Clark uh, projected to be one of the biggest records of the year and all of the other things and whatnot. Um, 20th Century Fox, you know, more or less like after that. And, you know, it, it didn't do that well at all. So that was the end of uh, the 20th Century Fox, you know, saga. But the money I made, I said I gotta invest this. I gotta, I gotta do something. I, I, you know, I see a lot of a lot of producers, performers, when they get older, they don't have no money. They don't have anything, you know. And I said I'm not gonna go down that way. So I um, uh, opened up a boutique. My wife at the time, you know, we said we're gonna in Plainfield, we're gonna open up a boutique. So we opened up this lady's boutique and whatnot, and a nice area, new. Mall area, nice. It was, it was beautiful, and right next door to it was AT and T, the phone center. You know, the the, the the you know the phone center where people uh, from Westfield, from uh, Scotts Plains, everybody come in to buy. Uh, you know, um, uh, <coughs> clothes, uh, pay, buy new phones, and they would come right next door to the store, and they buy clothes. I mean, it was very, very, very successful. Then Jimmy Carter announced the uh, breakup of uh, AT and T, and the uh, phone center store closed. I, I I picked that spot especially for the, for that area there, and so I said, now what I'm going to do? Then on Route 22 they opened up the flea market. I said this is not good. Well, my plan was to have my wife; she's going to work the store. I have to give that that's her her baby, and I was going to go ahead on and build my recording studio. So, what I did. I went on ahead and I did uh, build my recording studio. And um, uh, during a time where, you know, um, my um, my marriage, my second marriage was like, you know, on, on, on shaky ground. So when you when you try to do when you're a producer, when you you know, there's so many so many opportunities, so many things that's out there. You're busy when you travel, you know, the opportunities, and you have to be strong to avoid, you know, making mistakes, you know, um, of the of, of the opportunities and things like that. Um, my son Derek, he was getting bigger, you know, becoming, a, a, you know, a, a nice young, a very, very nice young man. And um, um, things were just changing. So um, I built my recording studio. And um, that was my second marriage. That was gone, so uh, I broke it up. But <coughs> what I had to do, excuse me, um, I um, construction costs and everything else was, it was going through the roof. I mean, that's that's the, the build that studio cost me over three hundred thousand dollars. It was great, with the equipment, and other, other things, and whatnot. So it was an expensive, expensive pro, uh, uh, project. Um, while I was building my studio, I was also going through a a, a heavy separation with my um, uh, my ex, and uh, that was um, so um, so sad. You know, it was, it was a, a sad situation there. And um, but there was a saying that I said, and it meant a lot to me how I said it. And we broke up. I said to her, I said, you know, I'm really, really sad that we broke up, that we, we, we're breaking up. And I told her, and I said, but I want to tell you something. The breakup of me and the soul generations, it broke my heart. And she looked at me and she said, what the heck was that about? In other words, it was just, you know, how much I was into that. Anyway. Um, while the studio was being, um, uh, while the studio was being built, I was getting, uh, you know, artists and people coming in, and so um, Kareek was one of the people that came in that uh, you know I, I, I was um, I was working with. They never been had really had ever been in the studio before, so I brought him in, and it didn't cost him a dime, didn't cost him a penny. I got my engineer that I had to pay. And I said, you know, he had his um, uh, uh, his guy transformer, and I let them work in the studio, you know. 
But little did he know that when they were in the studio working, that night, after they had left, I had always went back in and fixed, we fixed all the things that, you know, that was wrong with the track. We, we did, did, did things. But uh, Creek was so talented, you know, his rap, his flow, he was a talented guy. And I never forgot, the, the, the first time I, I knew that there would be a problem, I remember it was a sad thing, his father had passed away. And he says, you know, my father passed away, he said, but, you know, uh, I know I'm not like that anyway. So he said that, you know, I would, um, and, and I don't mean that in a, a negative way. He said that I will, if I got to come in the studio to do my job, I'll come in and do, uh, you know, and, and rap. That's how dedicated he was. That's the way I want to explain, I want to explain that, that he, uh, Karik was such a dedicated person, you know, to his job. And, um... Uh, eventually, Transformer wasn't working out right, so he had brought in Storm, this little kid. I said, what does this little kid know? But this little kid was good, and he was talented. He was doing beats and stuff like that. And so they did the beats, and uh, uh, we we did the tracks, and I said, I'm going to put out a single. And it, it was, the song was called uh, Think Like Your Enemy. I did a contract with uh, with, 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 with Karik. And under my contract, it had that I was going to, you know, that I put out the records and whatnot. If I sold or did something with a major label, he would get the percentage of what was promised to him on the contract. I gave him the contract. I said, take it to your lawyer. Take it to wherever you want, uh, Korea. And uh, uh, I told the other guys the same thing, uh, Stan and Steve. But... Um, Kareek was was the man calling you know, was calling the shots though, so um, when I had the record think like your enemy was out, um, I got a call from um, uh, Fred Mineo out of Select Records. He says, "I like that 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 song you got out there, Paul." He said, "You know, uh, can I talk to you about that?" So I said, "Okay, I'll be over there." So I went over. Now during that time. <laughs> Um, I had, a guy had came in, you know, to the, um, uh, came in with somebody else to my studio. And then he began hanging around there, and his name was Louie. And um, I guess you could say, um, call him um, Little Stinky Louie. That's what I call him. <laughs> and so um, um, Louie let's do into Creek. And when I finished Creek's album, you know, when I was finishing his album, let me put it like that, um, a neighbor of mine told me, they said, I have this singer that he's so talented, you know, uh, I don't know what to do, you know I mean? I mean, I mean, I mean can you just listen to him, Paul? I said, I don't have the time. It was rough times during that time because I wasn't paying. I wasn't giving. Uh, uh, I wasn't getting a dime for Kareem. You know, I, I mean, even though I owned the masters, I was paying the engineer. I wanted him to finish his product. I said, "Man, things are tight right now." <laughs> and so, as I was vacuuming the floor, I saw this man standing there, an old white man. He says, "Is this a recording studio?" I said, "Yes." He said, "I would like to record some songs." And he says, I travel throughout the world, and I want to, you know, record about the things I've done. He says, I have a friend who plays the piano. And I said, well, I said, well, how many songs are you talking about? And uh, he said, well, what do you, he said, what do you charge an hour? I said, I charge like $55 an hour. He says, well, I want to record at least 100 songs. I said, 100 songs? And so I'll tell you what I'll do, he says. I'm going to pay you in advance for 100 hours. I said, you are? And he paid me in advance, gave me a check right then and there for 100 hours. And I never saw him walk in, but when I was vacuuming, he was standing right there. I said, this guy must be some sort of an angel or something. I'll get back to that. So he went to background singers for one of his songs. And so I finally decided to meet with Terry Tate because Terry Tate was calling me. My neighbor told me I had to hear this guy sing. And so little did I know that I remember that 
when I was when I was MC, uh, hosting a, a talent show for this, uh, for the Pop Winner uh, Club or something like that, Terry Tate was singing with this group and they won first prize. So me and Terry's path had crossed. So I brought Terry in. I said, "Okay, Terry, I got something for you. You want to sing background with this guy in the studio here?" And so Terry went in there. He sung background, you know, whatever the guy wanted. And so then he came out and I said, well, Terry, what do you want me to do? I said, I could I, I pay you or I, and I, or I give you studio time or I could, you know, what do you, want me to, what do you want me to do for you? He said, well, Mr. Kaiser, he says, I work at the school for unwedded mothers. And there are a lot of kids, babies having babies, you know? I said, babies having babies. And that, <coughs> excuse me, that resonated in my head. I said, come on downstairs to the studio. I went downstairs and got, got, got on the piano. And we said, we started, we were working with that, that thing. Within the next two days, we were in the studio. Babies are having babies. And I put all my resources because the juices were flying. Terry was, just, Terry was just unbelievable. He recorded the song in one take, you know. Um, uh, really, he would have had he would have done it on the test take, but we were just getting the levels up, just that one. To, and then he recorded the song. Then I had him to do the background, you know, that's that stuff on the song. He did that, and I said, once again, those goose pimples started getting on my arm. You know, you can tell when you got a wreck, when you got when you got one, you know. And the goose pimples started getting on my. I said, ooh boy, I said I got one here, and so. Um, um, I put the whole song together, and um, uh, my engineer said, uh, "Paul, the way you put, the way you did the strings," he said, "You got the strings overlapping, like you know they, they overlap a little bit. You want to cut that out?" <coughs> and I said, "No," and then he said, "But why?" I said, "Because it's a hit anyway." I said, "Ain't nobody gonna tell the difference." So I said, that, you know, it's it's a hit," and so um, my wife's sister I recorded at that time. Her name was Jeanette. And she was expecting her record to come out. Uh, and so she was in my office and said, Jeanette, we're going to have to push your uh, record back a little bit because I have a record that's coming out and it's going to be a big hit. And she said, what, my record? And I said, no, it's not going to be a record. And I showed her a copy of the record, the Terry Tate. And she said, shoot. And she threw the record on the floor and stomped on it. I said, that's good luck, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> she started laughing. And so... The irony of it was this. I got a deep feeling that Terry Tate was the man. When I met with Fred Mineo, Fred wanted to do a whole album deal. After I played a couple of songs, he said, I want to do a whole deal with you on that situation there. Well, Terry made a lot of money, a lot of money. Did very, very well. <laughs> um, and um, uh, at that time, Trumpet Records was just like, Flowing money was, I mean, it was very, very successful. Um, Atlantic played me very, very well to get the rights to um, the Terry Tate project. But once again, I owned the project. When I gave Terry his contract, I said, Terry, take your contract, take it to a lawyer, take it to a lawyer. He said, okay. And the next day, I, he said, uh, I took it to my lawyer, and the lawyer said, everything is okay. I said, Terry, are you sure? I said, Please, because, you know, there'll be problems down the road. You, you sure you? I took it to my lawyer and everything is okay. All right. We were high on the run. He was traveling the, the colleges and making money, doing very well. But once again, when the, when the happy storm settles and whatnot, and you get down to reality. And so then he actually took his contract to a lawyer. And so then Terry came back to me and said, Mr. Kaiser, I took my contract to a lawyer. And I said, and yeah? And he said, I thought you took it to before. He said, well, this lawyer said, you got me by the balls. And I said, I got you by the balls. I said, well, uh, Terry, you should have took your, your contract to, to a lawyer. Anyway, we got along for you know um, a while. The industry was changing. I... Um, 
I I had many hits that was coming out of the room. Some of it was done by Entume. Some was done by um, this kid K Wise. He had some stuff that you know he did well. But um, everybody who was doing stuff though, the Japanese came out with a board called the Maki, the Maki mixing board, which can be in a home studio. All the recording studios in New York had this thing called Fairlights, the Fairlight system where you get all types of sounds and whatnot. Well, they came out with a regular keyboard that well, the Fairlight cost over seventy, eighty thousand dollars. The little keyboard cost like twenty five hundred dollars, two thousand dollars. A digital recording machine uh, cost one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Japanese came out with the ADATs and whatnot, which was like uh, two thousand dollars. So you can see all these studios. Everybody spent all this money for all this expensive stuff, and all of a sudden. They found a way to do it very, very, very cheap. And so the big studio was no longer needed anymore. It's the compact studio. I mean, there was always be some big studios in New York, but I saw the biggest studio when New York, you know, closed down. I, um, uh, I stayed open, though, and they, um, uh, um, what happened, um, uh, uh, Somebody who I knew who worked for me said, you know, I saw Cliffy. Paul, you and Cliffy need to get together and talk, you know, again and, you know, re really talk. And so Cliffy came down to my office and we talked and whatnot. And so we decided to do the remake of Body and Soul. And um, I said, well, maybe we put a rap to it. And so I got my son Derek and uh, he did the rap on, the, um, on that particular song. And... Um, it came out, you know, nice. We, um, I put it out and whatnot. And I got a little bit of airplay, but I couldn't get the you know, airplay. And one of the disc jockeys told me, <clears throat> he said, Paul, you expect for us to play this body and soul here? I don't care how clean it sounds. I don't care how good it sounds. He said, but the one you did back in the day was a classic. And you're not going to, you're up here trying to beat yourself. And you can't beat yourself. <laughs> so... As time went on, I shut the studio down. I, you know, I had to close the studio down, and I moved on. Um, I think that I got all the. I, I said all the things that I wanted to say. Uh, the, all the acts that I had signed to Trumpet Records, they did a show, the Trumpet Records special, and I sat back and I looked at all the talent that I had, and I said it's time for me to <laughs> fire everybody or, or shut it down because I said the talent was not there. Here's the problem. The problem was this. I spent a lot of time dealing with all the issues of being a studio manager, running a studio, recording studio, and I built the studio so that I can do my own stuff. Well, my studio was book, book, book solid, and I was trying to finish Terry Tate's album, and um, I had another song to do, so I went and booked another studio, and I took Terry there to finish it. And when I was there... I realized something. I realized how comfortable I felt. Without the phone ringing every two seconds and whatnot, without me dealing with this, just dealing with that, it was peace, peace of mind. And I said, I want that again. I said, uh, having a studio, you got all this running and all this crazy stuff you got to do. So at that time, the studio, I shut the studio down. Um, I sold my 24-track tape machine for more money than I paid for it. My board, I even, you know, um, it was too big to, to, to fit into my house because I was going to build my studio in my house. So um, as that era uh, ended, that was how I ended Trumpet Records at that time, and I moved on to another place and moved on to, 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 to go further in, 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 with my music career. Which is? I decided to, I stayed home for about maybe three, four months, getting my thoughts together. And I had a friend that had a, um, a record company, a company up in Englewood, New Jersey. His name was Jeff Collins. And so he wanted me to come up there and, you know, um, help him with his, the things he was doing. And we formed the label up there. And so I went up to Englewood. Um, what I did, though, I bought my son, uh, Derek, uh, you know, up there. I, I felt I owed it to him, and I brought him to Englewood with me. 
And so um, I had him and I had a singer by the name of Danny B. Smooth. Um, the first time I met, you know, I knew this person before, but George Kerr. George Kerr produced the um, Whatnots. He produced the um, Escorts, and he did a lot of things. We met and we hooked up up there in, in Inglewood. And, I rec and we recorded Danny B. Spooth, and we also recorded uh, my son, Derek, and some other artists, Fonda Ray. And I also went to another studio when I, I produced the Weather Girls. I did the Weather Girls on some stuff and whatnot. So I was, uh, I was pretty active. And so with my son, he had a, a song called out, More Babies Having Babies. And so we decided we are going to shoot a video on, on, on that. And I told Derek, I said, we're going to do a video. And, and so Derek was waiting for me. He thought that, you know, I guess they were looking for this big uh, production crew to be coming out. So along came me, my video, t uh, what do you call it, a cinematographer, and the makeup lady. <laughs> Derek, was waiting, so Derek was waiting for this big crew. But I said, don't worry, we're going to get this thing done. So in front of my father's house, we began shooting the video, the video. And then we went downtown Jersey City and we shot more. You know, my other son, Lawrence, he was also starring in the video. So Derek kicked it off and, you know, um, by the time we got finished with the video and we edited it and whatnot, that was a big, that was a happening video. That was, it was really, really nice. And Derek did uh, a, a fantastic job with, uh, uh, with doing it. And so um, it earned him a recording contract, you know. Uh, now I'm his father, so I, you know, went downstairs to Jeff's office and my son said to me, and I never will forget this yet, he said, well, Dad, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> So he signed the the contract with Jeff with, with Jeff Collins. I said, okay, right, that, that's that's a good thing. So he signed, and he finished up, worked on his you know his his recording contract, and he did what he you know what he had to do, and uh, things worked out right. With um, uh, I I did the the album on Danny Be Smooth. I did the song Let's Spend the Night that did very very well. Uh, me and George Kurt worked together. Then I got a call from a guy, and it brought back old memories when the guy said to me, I like what you did with my artist. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Danny B. Smooth was signed to somebody else when he came to me. And I said, Danny, what? He said, well, I, didn't, I haven't seen the guy in a year. I didn't, but you were still signed to him, though. He might have been waiting for you to do just something like that. But this time, being older and being a lot smarter, I said, can we work something out? That's just, you know, this don't make no kind of sense. So we sat down and we worked something out. And that, that, that I learned. Derek went on, he did his, 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 his album and, you know, he went on in the, as a performer. And uh, he did, you know, he, he did okay. His tracks were hot. And then he just decided, I don't know, Derek decided he didn't want to do any more rapping, uh, you know. I guess he went to this and his... Um, Career. I think that Derek was more of a behind the scenes type guy, you know, so that's what happened with him. So when me and Jeff ended our, our career, I decided to move on independently and I brought my sons in with me. That was Derek and my other son, Lawrence. <coughs> and I had my office up in, up in Englewood. And so Derek came to work every day working for me. And then I saw his talents begin to shine and my, my son's you know talents you know the shine um a guy came up there with a group called ready to roll and um uh it was a nice song Derek went over to bls or a hot 97 and um right away he got the record on the record was being played and you know we we're getting some buzz out of that song and then we had another artist Teresa walker but uh on some other stuff <coughs> my partner was a professional basketball player named Tony Campbell. And so uh, we, we worked together for a while because he, he was with the New York Knicks. And then the, the unforgivable happened. He got traded to the Dallas, the Dallas Mavericks. And he was, you know, unhappy about that. Derek would come to the office every day. It was like a fun fest. 
and it was funny. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I can tell you the things that <laughs> my son, well, they saw this, a side of me, too, that they had never saw before. And that was that I was a jokester. I was fun, and I was always always the the business part of it and whatnot. And there were more things that went on then. But up in Inglewood, um, I had my 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 son Kai's and my son Lawrence. They worked for me up there. Uh, that's when I saw the um, the talents in um, uh, my son Kai's. He was able to. He had the personality to get things done. He could get he could get airplay. He could get ads on the radio. And he could get, um, uh, you know, he could get people to play the record. He would go up to the stations in New York, and, and we had a record that was breaking all over the place in, in, in New York. And I told um, Kaiser, I said, we got to pull it. Uh, the guy never, there was this guy who had the um, had his group called Ready to Roll, and he told me he had no money, but could I put the record out for it? put the record out and help him out and to do the right thing and he's going to do the right thing and as soon as he heard the record on the radio and whatnot he went out of the contract told me I was in breach of contract somehow I don't know what that was after uh, Kai's did all the work to get it played so that was another phase in, you know in the, 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 the career and making things and, and making things happen he came up there one day and tried to roll over me with that and he got we were getting loud at the office there, and then he saw my son stand up. He saw a guy stand up, and he saw him stand up. And he looked around, and he decided to back up a little bit, I guess. So um, one day we were all in the office, my sons and me, and we were talking, we were laughing and everything. All of a sudden, I felt like a, like the room was like, was turning, like, <laughs> you know, like a, like there was some kind of volcano. It was just, just like an earthquake or something. But it wasn't an earthquake, it was my body limping like that. And, and then I, was, I knew something was wrong, and my heart began to race. I said, fellas, take me to the hospital, take me to the hospital. I went up to the hospital, and that was the beginning of a, 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 a terrible crisis, you know, a sad crisis in, in my life. I um, was told I had high blood pressure, and I had to take some blood pressure pills. And I don't think the doctor really Pick the right, the right kind. Anyway, I decided to lose a whole lot of weight and, um, you know, take uh, garlic pills. But once you get, you cross that line into high blood pressure, and hey, you can take all the garlic pills you want. You're there. You're stuck with it. You got the high. You got the high blood pressure. So that went on for a, 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 a number of years. And my my son and dad, we went to um, a um, uh, what was it? They Couple of conventions and things like that to uh, AC Atlantic City, Sammy my yeah, yeah and um, Sammy Sapp was also president of Columbia Records, uh, Sony Music at the time of, of A and R. He was a he was a heavy player. Then I, I had my my cousin um, uh, Mike Kaiser. He was just starting out as a promoter for one of the records, Def Jam for one of the record companies. So we were all beginning to uh, lead in our own way. And um, decisions had to be made about careers and things. My, my, my career was already made, already. You know, the music was my life. But my sons had to define, like Kai's had to make a decision on what he wanted to do. And um, uh, other people had to make decisions on what they did. But one of the funny things about the, uh, um, I had two girls that worked for me, and they were pretty big. <laughs> they were pretty big. And so, <laughs> I, I won't go into nothing, anything else, but it was, I was looking for my son, uh, Kai's, and so I saw this lady on the dance floor, she was big, and she was dancing, I thought she was dancing by herself, but as she turned around, <laughs> there was Kai's, <laughs> he was like, <laughs> he was in the, uh, I said, my goodness gracious, man, she was so big, he was lost in the sauce, and those are funny moments that, happened. Uh, a couple of years went by and me and my wife, my new wife, we were looking for a house. And so um, um, I was still doing things, you know, uh, musically. I started, I created a thing called The Big Show. The Big Show <laughs> consists of um, uh, all the top groups from the late 60s and, and, and 70s. 
from the Shylikes, the Delphonics, the Stylistics, the um, Ray Goodman and Brown, um, the um, uh, Soul Generations, Black Ivory, um, the Escorts, the Persuaders, uh, the main ingredient, uh, 25 acts of war, uh, McFadden and Whitehead. And I put on a show that I was selling out, and it was a, a fantastic, I mean, it was great. And I was doing a show, going to do a show in um, Washington, D.C., and in Baltimore, Maryland, with all these acts. And also, I also added to the show The Dells. And I was coming out of this building, and I collapsed. And I don't know what happened, but um, it was the beginning of a, a sickness that uh, would paint my, paint my future, uh, you know, moving forward within my life. I had a major blocked artery that almost killed me. And I will leave it like this, and I will come back and tell you life after heart surgery.